So GDL is a powerful feature within ARCHICAD. Now, it's one that can be actually really scary for a large portion of ARCHICAD users out there. Now today, Pat May from 4D Proof will share with you some handy tips on how even the most basic user can benefit from knowing just a little bit of GDL. Now, this is without the scripting. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Pat. Okay, um, we are talking GDL here, and uh, I am uh, going to walk you through sort of my approach to, uh, to GDL, uh, which is to essentially save the elements that you've modeled. Um, now, there are, uh, there are ways that you can go into file uh, libraries and objects and say new object, uh, and you can script this out. You can create uh, subtypes and really define what this is and, and manually type out the 2D and 3D script if you've learned the language. Uh, there's great uh, resources out there for learning GDL. Um, my approach has always been to uh, simply um, model uh, whatever you need as an object, whatever you need in your library part, uh, and then to save it as an object, and, and uh, kind of exploring ways that we can customize those automated, automatically generated scripts. Now I have a, a pendant light here uh, that I've just uh, grabbed a screenshot from. That screenshot is actually kind of important for uh, saving these objects out. Uh, and then I, I modeled this using shells and morphs. And I'm going to give you a quick uh, rundown on why it may be important to review what you're modeling the elements with before you save them. Um, I've also drafted over here a, uh, a 2D symbol. I'm going to actually drop a hotspot on that symbol as well. And we're going to talk about what those hotspots do for us uh, in a, in a uh, plan script. The other thing that you'll notice is on um, this shell element, I've located it where the, uh, the actual shade itself starts at 0, 0. Uh, and that actually becomes kind of important when we start to manipulate these elements. And we'll walk through that. Uh, here in a bit. But just to start off, I'm going to save this uh, shell as an object and this um, this morph as an object just to do a side-by-side -side comparison. To, so to save this as an object, I select the shells, I go to uh, Libraries and Objects, Save Selection as Object. Uh, I'm going to call this uh, Pendant from Shell and say OK. Here you can see the attributes that were used for building those shells. Um, and this is actually really important so uh, that I can identify what these attributes are being used for. Um, if I had, for example, uh, say 10 surfaces, it's going to identify 10 surfaces. All of the elements using this color black surface are grouped together. So if you need individual surface settings, parameters in the final object, model them with individual surfaces um, before you save them. Same with pens, fills, lines, etc. Make sure that you're using independent, individual, unique attributes wherever needed, and wherever they're not needed, group them together. So for example, all of the, um, the line settings for all of those shells are set to pen 3 so that I know that all of my pens in the final uh, object are going to be using pen 3. Um, so I can call this uh, line pen, and this is my cut fill pen, uh, which is using the building material extracted um, from that. So again, that's if you if you are using different cut fills, uh, those are generated by building materials now. Um, and then I can say that this is my shade surface. This is my uh, hardware surface and this is my bulb surface. So by by defining those attributes before you save them it makes identifying the parameters later a lot easier. Now I go to change details. This is where that screenshot comes in. Uh, so I can grab um, this screenshot right here and that's going to be my thumbnail. I can give myself the, the author name, uh, put a description in here, Um, you know, give it all the pertinent information that might get people back to uh, to me. If I'm sharing it in a larger firm or with other people, I might even put my email in there if, if I'm really getting complicated with the script uh, so that other people can ask questions. Uh, here I can give keywords. Um, and these are important uh, because they're searchable in the, uh, the object settings, in the library settings. You can search for specific objects. 
Um, so here I'm going to go ahead and say change those details and then say OK. Um, now if I grab my object tool, that's going to be the first object that's placed. Uh, here, because I'm, I'm ultimately not going to use the morph, so I'm just going to, as a side-by-side -side comparison, save this out. I'm not even moving it to zero, but I'm going to say uh, libraries and objects, save selection as object, and I'm going to call this uh, pendant from morph, and save that. You could do the same thing, change those names, change the details, say OK. And uh, now if I go in here, uh, there's two pendant lights. And if we look at those side by side, you can see that they look uh, basically identical. Um, they're both resizable. Uh, and you do notice that uh, if I do resize, it distorts the whole thing. Uh, we're going to get around that because obviously manufacturer specific things, we might want them to have a fixed size. So we're going to take a look at that a little bit later. But for now, I just want to do a side by side comparison. So I'm opening these objects up on the Mac, it's Command Option O, or it's File, Libraries and Objects, and Open Objects. And that'll open up the script for these objects. Uh, so here, side by side, I have the pendant from the shell. If I look at the 3D script, the script that's using uh, it's using to generate this 3D geometry, um, there's maybe a few dozen uh, lines of script, certainly less than 100 lines of script to define this. Because it's really just a shell is defining the polyline of a shape and then revolving it around a certain number of degrees. Uh, so saving a shell as, as an object is super efficient. A morph, on the other hand, um, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of objects. It defines, for every polygon, it defines a vertices, um, a, a line, and a surface. So there's just thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of script here. So it's, it's really kind of a messy way to build objects. It's not that I would want to discourage anyone from using the morph tool to build an object. It's just that you need to be aware that uh, the script is a lot more unmanageable. And then beyond that, if we look at the library manager now, uh, for those two objects, uh, you can see here that uh, the morph object is uh, seven times the size as the pendant object. Uh, and depending on the complexity of the object, that could even be a bigger problem. Um, this is a pretty small object, so 700 kilobytes, I wouldn't even think twice about placing that object 100 times in my model if the polygons are, are number of polygons is small enough. Um, but if it's a revolved shape like this, I always gravitate towards the shell. So uh, we're going to go ahead and just blow that morph off of here. Um, now I want to take a look at saving this object so that it's maximizing its functionality. The first thing I'm going to do, I modeled this uh, pendant hanging height as a separate thing, and I'm just going to blow that off of there. Uh, and then I'm going to move this over uh, set distance, we'll say two feet. Um, and I'm going to drop that vertically down as well to that zero, zero point. So that when I move it over and save that as a separate object, I know that it's saving exactly from that same point. We're using the zero, zero location to essentially um, define the origin for all of these elements. So here I'm going to basically create subparts. I'm going to go into libraries and objects, save selection as object, and we're, we'll just put all these, these things in a, in a folder. And we're going to call this first, uh, we're call, we'll call the folder uh, pendant parts, and we'll call this one shade. Um, and we're going to save that. We're not going to worry about any of this information right now. We'll say OK. Um, and then I just place that object right there, uh, just so that uh, I know exactly where it's at, um, and I can get to it later. We'll move all of this stuff over that two feet, and now I just want to save just this upper part, just this piece right here uh, that mounts to the ceiling. And I'm going to go to File, Libraries and Objects, Save Selection as Object again, and pendant parts, and we'll call this ceiling mount. And again, it has those same surfaces and everything, and the pens and the attributes are all fine. So I say OK there, and I go in and place that. So now I have my two objects that I can combine in a little bit, uh, but I want a third part, and that's the plan symbol. And the plan symbol is going to be different than those other two parts. Uh, so if I go, I select those, and these are just polylines, a hotspot, and a piece of text. So I go to File, Libraries and Objects, Save Selection as Object, and we'll just call this 2D. And OK. Um, not worrying about what any of the parameters are on that, and then we grab that guy. So there's my three parts. If we look at those in 3D, um, I've got the top part, the shade, and the 2D symbol that I want to combine and then connect those together. 
So the first thing we're going to do, uh, we can certainly start by uh, just opening those up, Command Option O, or File Libraries and Objects, and Open. You have th three library parts selected. I'm going to say Open All, and I'm going to get three separate tabs here. Uh, the 2D tab, uh, we don't need to worry about the 3D script because there is no 3D element. All I need is this 2D stuff. Now, here's where we need to get into understanding the script just a little bit. Uh, it's not critical to understand everything about this script, just enough to troubleshoot and get this to work. So the first two lines are a mole command and an add command. Now, the mole command is for resizing. That's saying as a ratio of A and B, if we look at the parameters, it's going to be resizable in those dimensions. Uh, for my 2D script, I don't need this to be uh, resizable. So I'm just going to hit the void command, that little exclamation mark. Uh, same with the add command. So if you look in the floor plan, right, we saved these from 0, 0. Well, ARCHICAD wants to save it relative to the bottom left so that the whole thing's in the positive quadrant. So really, it would actually float something like this with that add command, which means that my, uh, my shade, also following that same logic, right, wouldn't line up with my 2D symbol. So the add command becomes problematic for us. And uh, we can, uh, same thing that we did with the other one, we can just add an exclamation mark or select the line and hit the void command right there. Um, similarly, because we're combining these scripts, I can just grab the whole thing, uh, accept those lines or delete those lines and uh, copy that. And we're just gonna combine this into the shade object. Uh, here in the 2D script, there's a lot of lines of script for this poly 2B. That's just defining these shapes, these geometries. Um, but we're going to grab all of that and I'm just going to delete that out of here because I don't actually need it in here. Uh, and then I'm, I copy the script. Oops, don't want to close. Uh, I copy the script here and I paste it into here. And now I'm going to see this, uh, this floor plan symbol that I had before. Uh, you can click check script to make sure that everything's fine, there's no script errors. Because I voided these lines, I can just get rid of those. Now, another thing that I always do when I'm working on objects is I add a line of script. Now, there's, there are going to be probably four or five lines of script that you're going to need to know. Uh, but this one is project2, that's P-R-O-J-E-C-T-2, space 3, comma, 270, comma, 2. So this is the projection type. So it's going to be a floor plan projection. The rotation is going to be from the 270 degree angle or basically looking at the bottom as the bottom. And then the two is uh, the style. So that's like uh, shaded, unshaded line, etc. cetera. Um, if I refresh this, now you can see where my uh, plan symbol and my 3D um, uh, geometry line up. They're misaligned. Uh, so we can fix that. Same thing we did before. Um, Actually, there's so these are just descriptors written in ARCHICAD, etc., etc., etc. Get rid of those, and then I want to get rid of the mole and the add commands right here. So I get rid of those lines, and uh, now I should see my floor plan symbol lines up, my 2D and my 3D floor plan, uh, or my my 3D projection and my floor plan symbol 2D uh, symbol line up. Ultimately, I'm going to void this line, but in the meantime, it's a good way to check that all of this is, uh, is lining up. Um, so now I want to put the ceiling mount in here, but before I do that, I want to make sure that I understand what all of these scripts are. So one thing that I do when I'm combining scripts like this is I'll add dividers. So exclamation mark, and I just usually use the, uh, the equal symbol because when you're uh, scrolling through hundreds of lines of script, uh, it becomes a lot easier to um, uh, to spot these. So if I just go like this and copy that, paste it down a couple of lines, uh, and then I'm going to add another note in here, so exclamation mark and lampshade script. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing here, and I'm going to paste this, and I'm going to call this uh, ceiling mount script. Right. So here's my, my ceiling mount script. So here, I'm going to go to my 3D script. I'm going to void the mole commands. 
I'm going to get rid of those first lines of script because I don't need them. So all of the mole commands, mole x, y, and z, resize, and the add command, I'm going to get rid of all of those or, or uh, void them. And then I'm going to grab this entire script and copy that. And again, because this was made from a single shell, the script is actually really, really short. Um, now I want to go back into the shade object and I'm going to paste this into here. All right, so there's my there's my lamp and my shade. And if we look at that in 3D, uh, you can see that it's basically combining all of these together. Um, there is one thing that I think the shade because it was uh, or the the ceiling mount because it was built with only that single um, uh, material attribute, that single surface one, and in the shade it had the three surfaces. So if I go into my parameters, material one is actually using that tan, material two is using that black. So here, just using kind of some reverse engineering, understanding the how the script works, here's my shade, uh, and I want to look for material attribute in here, not building material. Uh, there will be a material attribute in this script, pen attribute, line attribute, building material. Well, we can also say Add that in here, that should also fix that. Um, we'll probably circle back to this. I know that in here somewhere, uh, I'm just not seeing it for some reason. Oh, here we go, material attribute one. Material attribute one, we'll change all of those to material attribute two. Those are just the different vertices, vectors of, uh, of that, um, the polygon that's defining that. So if I change all of those to material attribute 2 instead of 1, uh, now I can see that that turns black. There we go. That's what I was aiming for. Okay, so now we have that upper part and the lower part, and they're both, because of the, uh, the voided add command and mole commands, they're both centering on that point, but I want the shade to drop below that a certain distance. So to do that, I need to add a parameter in here, and that's going to be an add command. Uh, I know that we voided out this add command, but now we want to insert our own add command in here. Uh, so if I go into my parameters, and I'm just going to, up here at the top, we can avoid that uh, use stored environment, that's not critical, uh, and it just clutters up the script. Um, so here I'm going to call this uh, HNGHT. Uh, it has to start with a letter, uh, and then you can call that whatever you want, just no special characters. Um, the parameter types for this, you can see we have a, a whole range here. Uh, but this is the dimensional parameter. This is that any distance I have in here is going to be reflected in that line of script. Um, so I'm going to call this hanging height. And I'm going to say that this goes, uh, let's go um, start at one foot. Um, so if I go into my 3D script, uh, now any modifier, that's the add mole commands, uh, is going to affect any script below it. So here, uh, and this is why I put this at the top, so that when I have an add z negative hng underscore ht, right? So add z, this is affecting any script that follows this. It doesn't affect the uh, top script because it's been added below that. Uh, if we rotate that now, we can see that we have this negative hanging height right here. So really simply put, this is... Uh, all I need to do to get that hanging height. And if we look at this in 3D, there's that. Uh, looking at my parameters, um, if I wanted this to be 5 feet, for example, uh, it stretches out 5 feet. All right? But let's go back to 1 foot, just keep it nice and compact. In fact, we might even just say 6 inches. Keep it really tight there so we can see what's going on. Um, so that part is super simple. Um, another note is that because we got rid of the mole commands, um, we don't need these a, b, z, z, y, z, x. So these are just the x, y, and z uh, dimensions of the original element. So we have that uh, all resolved here. 
Uh, if I go to File and Save, and uh, wait a couple of seconds, there we go. Let's go to our floor plan now. You can see that I've got that object, um, the uh, 3D projection and the 2D symbol. There's a hot spot right there um, that's kind of weird, but uh, I think that that's just the overlay of the 3D and the 2D. If we look at that in 3D, here's that object. It has this cluster of stuff up above it because that's uh, um, the positive quadrant for that 2D symbol. But really, the only one that we need to worry about is that 0, 0 uh, point right there. And we'll add that hotspot into 3D as well, which should eliminate uh, most of those uh, other 2D generated hotspots. Um, looking at this object, uh, here's that hang height. You can see that I lost all of the uh, the size parameters here. So let's make this, uh, you know, five feet, for example. And then you see that the the ceiling point right here stays where it's at. That's why when I put that script in here in 3D, uh, I say hang height negative so that uh, this positive parameter, I could just say it's, it's whatever distance it needs to be, and in 3D, the shade drops below that. Um, but now I need to connect those two pieces. So I'm going to come down here to the bottom, and uh, this, this is essentially the first line of script that you need to know, is this add Z command. Um, and Z is just that Z coordinate. And here, uh, let's go back up and we're just going to copy this stuff down. So we have dividers, just clear notation on what is being used for what different parts. Um, so I'm going to call this hanging cord. And uh, this is the next line of script. Now remember that add Z command uh, is in effect for anything after it. If I wanted to end that add Z command, I could say del, uh, I would just say del top here because that would delete all modifiers all the way to the top. Um, but in this case, I actually want uh, this, this cylinder that I'm going to script to drop down that distance. So here um, I'm going to, uh, and let's go ahead and add a parameter. And we'll call that chord diameter, and we'll say that that is a quarter of an inch. So now I need those two parameters, uh, hang height and chord D. And in my 3D, I'm going to type cylind, that's C-Y-L-I-N-D. Uh, and I always manage to get this backwards, but uh, let's um, hang height and chord D. Um, and then we will check. So I got it right. If you get it backwards, one is the radius, one is the height. Um, and uh, we'll actually take chord D divided by two so that it's the true diameter and not the radius. Um, and that's that's all we need right there is uh, that, that scripted chord coming down. Um, if we look at this in 3D, it's very likely to be using some weird building material, weird surface. Um, but this is where if I have, uh, I kind of bumbled through this before, but if I apply this material, material 2, to that element, so it's using probably the, the material used for the bulb that's inside otherwise. So now that's uh, applying that material applies to this element below as well. Um, so this is this is my uh, my 3D element. Like I said, I do want to add a hotspot to the very top and center so that I know I'm snapping uh, that that fixture to the ceiling. So here, all I have to do is say hotspot and call this uh, zero comma zero comma zero. And this is again saving that from that origin, that zero zero origin is really critical. This is what gives me that point to save from. So now when I go to file and save. And we'll take a look at this in 3D. Um, I can see that hang height right there. Um, I still have a few of those hotspots kind of lingering, but the critical thing is that I have a hotspot right here at 0, 0. Um, so basically, if I go to place this thing, you know, and, and let's, let's even say that we place this from floor plan. So I grab this thing and I place it from floor plan to project 0. Uh, let's just put a, we'll put a slab in here as our ceiling. 
Um, and this slab is at, uh, let's say it's at nine feet to project zero from the bottom. Um, now in my plan view, if I grab this object and say that, yeah, this object is nine feet up and say, okay, and snap that in here, um, I should get that snapping directly to the underside of that ceiling, this plane right here and that origin point now align. So when I have this set, I could set this to two feet, for example, and I know that it's gonna shrink or grow from that point. Um, and then the last thing to do is just to make sure that, uh, that we have this as a symbolic view and we don't have that overlay. And there's actually a really cool uh, way that we can modify this as well uh, in the 2D script. We can actually use an uh, if-then statement um, to say that it's one or the other of these, either the 3D or the projection. Um, this is actually a really useful trick for uh, um, combining multiple scripts together. So here, let's uh, let's add a parameter in here, and let's call this uh, sim type, uh, and this is going to be a text parameter, and we're going to call that symbol type. So I'm going to copy this script, and here we're going to go to the parameter script, and I'm going to write a values line, and uh, sim tip. That's my parameter, and I'm going to say projected. And these are all in parentheses, comma, symbolic. So now looking at the parameters, uh, because the sim type is pulling from that parameter script, I now have oops, project D, projected. Um, I now have options for projected or symbolic. And I can add this as an option to that 2D script. So sim type here. Uh, I can go to my 2D script, and uh, here I can do an if-then statement. I can say if sim type equals projected, then and if. Uh, and let's check that script. Oh, I think these are supposed to be on one line. Fix that quickly. There we go. Uh, and I can come here and say if uh, sim type equals symbolic, then, and I'm just going to adopt this script right here as the then statement. So now when I come into, and we'll say end if. And you can see that this goes to just the symbolic. The reason for that is the default is set to projected. So if I set this to symbolic now, uh, I'm going to have that symbolic view. In 2D, the symbolic view had a hotspot. So I'm just going to add a hotspot. And here in 2D script, I need to use hotspot 2. So typically, uh, any script is, is oftentimes applicable to 2D and 3D scripts. But by saying that this is specific to the 2D script, I'm saying hotspot 2. And there's only an X and a Y axis in 2D. So I just say 0, 0 here. Uh, and we'll save that. Now I have my default object right here with that, that uh, symbolic view. I have my projected script right here. So I can switch it to projected. And you notice that it stays in that origin point. By saving it at 0, 0, getting rid of those add commands, I know that it's always going to stay at that center. Um, if I had saved this shell all the way over here, those add commands can be useful because it's gonna, I know that it's going to drop it to this point. Uh, but I would have to do the math to figure out how much this needs to offset up and over to line up with it. Um, so the best, the best course of action is to save them from a common point, all elements from a common point as they relate to each other, and eliminate the add commands uh, and insert your own as needed. Okay, so that's my light fixture. Um, there's a couple of other things that we need to do with this fixture now. Uh, if I look at this in my, in my uh, um, element settings, you notice that it just shows up as shade because it hasn't been saved as an actual object. You know, when we first saved the object, we put in all of the uh, the parameters and settings and all of that. So let's go ahead and dial this in just a little bit more. Um, so just like I saw when I first saved it, I can put an author name here.
you know, just whatever information is pertinent to this object so people can, uh, can uh, know essentially who to blame if something's really messed up. Uh, and then the keyword commands, like I said before, are, are really important. So here we'll say um, uh, keywords are lamp, pendant, uh, rejuvenation, etc. Whatever, uh, whatever um, uh, keywords I need there. And then my preview picture. Here I get my preview picture. So I'm just going to grab this screenshot and go Command A, Command C, and come into here and paste that in here. So here's that preview picture. Uh, when I close this, now I get that thumbnail. So that's all back to what we had um, when we first saved the object. Uh, but I don't want this to be called Shade. So I'm going to go into File, uh, Save As, not Save. I'm going to save this as, and, and I'll just put this in the main uh, embedded library rather than uh, Pendant from Shell or Pendant or Pendant Parts. I'm going to call this uh, and you could put in the model number, whatever. Uh, the big things are you don't want special characters, uh, and really you're not trying to write a book, right? Uh, I know that sometimes you see downloaded objects or saved objects that just have way too many descriptors. Um, you know, if, if you're doing a collection of re rejuvenation parts, uh, you can certainly um, uh, name them by a specific model number, but uh, keeping it as simple as possible makes it most usable. Okay, so now I have this object saved. I'm going to close out of this, close out of this. Uh, I don't need to save that, and close out of this, and I don't need to save that. Now, there's a little bit of cleanup that oftentimes gets overlooked, uh, and that's in the library manager. When you're kind of using this method, you end up saving a lot of parts and pieces. So you end up with these pieces right here that we don't need anymore. We'll delete those out. The whole pendant parts, the reason I like putting these in subfolders is so that I know they're there. Um, but they're also adding uh, to the file size, depending on how big your file is and how many custom objects you make. They can bloat things up quite a bit. Um, so I'm just going to delete those out of there and end up with this single uh, light. As you know, with library management, this results in all of these parts going missing. Um, so I can just grab this piece right here. And in my embedded library, I can inject it into that element type right there, which shot way over here for some reason. But... Uh, you know, if we come back into the object, we know that we're lined up on that ceiling because that's how that object was scripted from that zero, zero point. Uh, the Romania objects, they were just uh, sort of uh, pieces used for modeling this. Certainly, if, uh, if you ever felt the need to modify this in the future, uh, you can put these things, the original elements, on a hidden layer. Uh, that's not a bad idea. But keeping the original scripted parts, is it's never been useful to me because those really have been combined here. Uh, and as long as you're consistent with always saving relative to 0, 0, you know that you can always come back in and recreate those parts. So I hope this helps give you uh, a couple of ideas on how you can build your own light fixtures, plumbing fixtures, uh, whatever you can model really. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's not exclusive to using the shell tool. You can model things with slabs, beams, columns. Um, the only thing that I suggest not doing is saving an object as an object. That creates macro problems. Um, but any other object, and uh, if, for example, you did have an object that you wanted to save as an object, let's just um, pull from the ARCHICAD library. We'll just grab this partition stuff, for example. If I place this partition stuff <coughs> and I make some changes to it, maybe add a whole bunch of stuff, make it something else, um, you can convert this to a morph um, and, and save that as an object if that's really what you needed. Uh, but saving that object as an object is going to mean that it's going to go missing in project migrations and cause all sorts of problems. So using this method, really use what I call model primitives. Um, that's in the toolbox. It's the, uh, the wall, column, beam, slab, roof, shell, uh, and morph tools. Uh, uh, mesh as well, I guess, is also applicable to this. Um, anyway, that, that hopefully gives you an idea on how to create custom objects uh, from saving out the basics um, to modifying them into fully parametric and editable manufacturer-specific elements. Thanks a lot for your presentation, Pat. Now, for people that are new that have joined 
session um, since we last had our live Q&A. If you want to sign into the chat, make sure that you uh, just click on to sign on to it on the side there. Just insert your name. Don't worry, Vimeo is not capturing any details. It's just so you can participate and see the chat as we're going on. Anyone that has any questions, please post them in the chat now for Pat and we'll go through them. So thanks a lot, Pat. Thanks very much for your presentation. Thank you. Now, one of the funniest questions I saw up there or the comments up there is someone saying they couldn't see your beard. I was pretty disappointed, but now I'm sure they're happy they can see it. Now, well, I haven't shipped off yet. <laughs> well, you'd, you'd have to do probably one of those um, fundraisers, I reckon, to do that. You'd probably make some good money if you but to do uh, to fundraising and say, shave off your beard. But um, there's, there's a gentleman here in Australia that I participate with, uh, uh, built conferences, who uh, has had a beard for his children's whole lives. And one day he shaved it off and his children didn't know who he was. So I'm assuming you'd have the same problem as well. <laughs> it's the same problem, yeah. All my kids would recognize it. <laughs> there's some comments in here in regards to syntax um, and highlighting. I think that's kind of um, really interesting. Um, it's probably more of a, a, a feature request for Graphisoft more than anything. And um, self, along with a few other people like Christian Bursell, who, who lives in GDL land, would probably benefit from it greatly. Um, Graham has asked a question. Um, will this be available to revisit later? The content will probably, don't know when we'll get it up. It'll probably be a couple of months away. Um, it won't be free if we do get it up. It'll be posted and all the other expenses behind keeping it afterwards. But... Um, Pat, you've, you've said to me that um, anyone wants uh, a copy of some of the content that you put together today, you're um, happy to do so. So once Pat and I have finished chatting, um, we'll place a, um, Pat can place some comments in there in regards to how you can reach out to him to get access to Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share. So a couple of things there. I'm happy to share the, the PLN file I used to create this object, as well as the PL object if you want to try and kind of reverse uh, what we as far as the syntax question, as there are a couple of things that I didn't cover uh, before, and uh, that's that there are two shortcuts with script. There's command F on a Mac. Uh, you can use find and replace text. Uh, the reason I didn't use that as I was bumbling through to find that specific line is that it finds the last instance of that text, and the replace replaces all instances of that text. Um, and then there's another line or another shortcut, command L, will jump you to. So if you do check a script, there's an error in that script, you can jump to that line. It'll tell you what line it's on, and typing command L will jump to that line. Uh, hopefully reverse engineer. Now, I just want to touch on, there's a couple of comments regarding Paramo, and I'll touch on, I'll go to that in a second, but before we talk about Paramo, uh, there's another comment from Graham in regards to um, when the ceiling mount is selected, are mm -hmm. the nodes, why are the nodes around the object much larger? That's, that's a projection of the floor plan symbol. Because the floor plan symbol is a different size, the X and Y proportions of that are different, projecting that onto the um, Typically, if you have a manually typed in hotspot in 3 and 2D, you kind of ignore each other. The, other. Um, I've had a mixed bag of results with that work. So uh, that would be my suggestion, is to manually type in a hotspot at 0, 0, and 0, 0, 0, and 3. Cancel those. Uh, There's a comment, couple of comments around Paramo, and there's there's been some interesting comments around Paramo. Mixed mixed bag of opinion. Now, for a person that's working with, um, what's your thoughts on? Have you have you have you tried to do something similar with Paramo yourself? I, I have actually. Yeah. There's I mean, there's so many different ways to. Uh, that, that's the great thing about Archicad, right? Is that there's there's a dozen or more ways to do anything, and uh, adding this feature of Paramo into Archicad uh, is is a great addition, really, uh, for people who may be intimidated by uh, this language. Um, for me personally, I've been scripting for so long that uh, and and Paramo has just been available on Mac for for a while. Um, it's it's basically I think if people are familiar with Grasshopper, comfortable with Grasshopper, I think the transition of learning that is going to be learning GTL. Um, but essentially, Paramo just takes those scripts, like uh, you know, basic script commands for geometries and like that, and adds them as graphic input. Uh, the modifier commands get to be a little bit screwy, Paramo, 
Um, but I think once you break that learning curve, uh, and I don't know if that learning curve is, is steeper or shallower than just learning GDL, um, but once you break that learning curve, I think that it's probably going to be a great addition for a lot of firms. Um, me personally, I, I anticipate sticking uh, with GDL scripting, building and saving uh, with this sort of no script or limited script method. That yeah, some of the things that I've found, most of the things that I'm creating, I don't actually parametrics so sometimes it's easier to build it itself um, right well that's that's a really good point is like with this object i go into a deep dive of you can do this and you can do that and you can do this but if all you're doing is building this this uh fixture and you know that it's this geometry just save it as an object and you're done you don't need to get into all that that diving in it doesn't need to be metric or have custom um you know saving the object out like we saw in the first now one of the things that I also think that's really point that Venata makes is by making the subtypes, um, you could potentially actually use Paramo to combine them all together, so you get all the types together. That's that's very true. Yeah, I mean, the, there I I in the past I've just used that values command, like we looked at in the, uh, the parameter script, adding values and adding options for uh, if then statements copying and pasting multiple scripts together. I've done that for plumbing fixtures where I have a manufacturer with four different models and combine those into an object. Uh, and it's, it's as simple as, uh, like we looked at here, copying and pasting together and combining. Um, but I, I do anticipate that Paramo is probably going to be a pretty big breakthrough. Um, you know, there, there's also that, that uh, add-on library part maker that I kind of dabbled with for a while if people are intimidated by scripts. Way to uh, build out more parametrics and kind of make the library parts more uh, familiar with the, the Model view options. There are options like that out there. Um, this is just sort of the most stripped down, basic, save an object and make. Which is something that a lot of people would work with. Now, now, Julian, I think seems overcome by your presentation, and and, and that's always the case. Once once you start to open up a GDL script, he's talked yep. about it's going to take him a long time to learn. Now, I can put my hand up and honestly tell everyone that's watching today that I have never actually gotten into too much GDL. We, I did some dabbling when we were trying to create some crazy ideas where we're turning existing buildings into objects uh, for site context um, on, on major school projects. Um, but I'm not, I haven't gone into it in that much detail. But um, do you actually have any tutorials online at all, Pat? Um, I do have, I have a YouTube channel. Uh, I can post a link to that on the, the comments. Um, uh, there's a there is a website. It's just sort it's it's a cheap Google site that I use sort of as an internal blog for uh, sort of keeping track of everything that I've learned or taught myself or I've had mentors that have taught me some tricks. Uh, so it's just a list of of tips and tricks that I've accumulated over the years. It's uh, no script pl dot info, um, and it it kind of takes through. It, I've built it to to organize in no scripting, some scripting, all script. Um, it's it's just my sort of online diary of of uh, script. I got a, a question from Michael. What's some of the, your key ideas? That you um, when you're building out an object like this, uh, the tools you use. If you're modeling the the object with tools, the tools that you use are critical. Um, if you're using custom profiles, for example, on a wall and saving that as an object, you're going to generate usually between five and and uh, 15 times as many polygons as if you apply that profile to a beam. Uh, the end condition where walls meet, they try to interlace as opposed to a beam uh, chamfers that end off. Um, so that's the first thing is just be aware of how many polygons are in the elements before the object. Uh, in that demonstration, we, uh, we looked at shell versus the morph tool. Morph tool is one of the worst tools for saving objects as, uh, or elements as objects trying to reduce the polygons. Uh, sometimes it's inevitable. The morph tool is a great tool for modeling geometries. Um, and it, it's certainly not a bad tool, to use, one that you have to be aware of the number of polygons. And I think, I guess, the key thing with that is to make sure that you download the keys for each release, have releases, have access to polygon count. Is that something you refer to often? Or is it just yeah, kind of through a sense uh, you know that already? Yeah, the polygon uh, polygon count add-on is it's a shortcut in my work environment because I, I use it on project audits, object building. You know, I use it probably ten or fifteen. 
Yeah, well, we don't have a tips and tricks session, today, but having having that loaded and checking your models for, for project health is always a good one. Um, yeah. We've got a question from Mary. Why would you make an object this way instead of using a custom profile? Script work is a whole other level. That's true. <laughs> It, it is true, and, and the truth is, if you just built that as a shell and placed that in your model and that's all you needed, that's, that's fine, that's great. Uh, the advantage to saving it as an object is that you then have the ability to, in a single element, customize the two parents versus that there. And that is taking it up a notch, but if you're looking at using that fixture to document your plans, you don't want to see that round uh, shape, you want to see your, your ceiling fixture symbol. Um, if you just model it as a shell and then have a drafted two part, then you've got to coordinate any changes to the design uh, should that fixture move or the design move around that fixture. Um, this, this gives you the ability to save it as a single element. It means that moving that element moves the 2D symbol as well as the 3D projection. Uh, and it also means that the whole thing is resizable and scalable. So uh, maybe a, a light fixture is a bad example, but there might be uh, instances with like furniture, for example, where you want the whole thing to scale proportionate subpart. Um, so it's more difficult to do that with, say, a morph or an extreme shape uh, that retains its, its uh, uh, x geometry, but not the y and the z. Yeah, plus the portability, not just it means you can, you can roll it, put it onto, inside the library part of the BIM server. Absolutely, yeah, and saving that out, like I saved it to the embedded library, but you can set the destination to your desktop and send that out to other project teams save it to an office shared library. Uh, it can go out to all projects or templates uh, rather than uh, just sort of as a place element. Yeah, and I think that's where you get your best, best bang for dollars because you're going to spend the time in investing and building some content. And, and you know, there's a number of users that, you know, that, are, that, that we, both you and I, talk to that, that build libraries of all of their content that they have and just become part of their everyday practice work. Um, yeah. Tim, Tim's made a comment regarding VS Code has a plugin for GDL. Um, that is Spanish to me. I'm, I'm sorry, Tim. It's not a, is that, is that something that, that makes sense to you at all, Pat? What, what was the something code? V, VS code has a plugin for GDL and through the, um, GDL website of, of Graphisoft. So it's in the comments. Um, Daniel says he's really excited about the best, best GDL presentation he's ever seen. So congratulations there, Pat, Pat on the back already. Um, the possible rewatch later, as I said earlier, um, we may or hopefully we'll get this up in a couple of months' time. Um, but find a paywall if we do get it up. Um, Jason's asked a question of you, Pat. Um, would also suggest selecting the subtype for library parts. In other words, he's taking that to the level, I guess, rather than just the, the parent. Yeah, you can you can as assign things as subtypes. And uh, that's actually, so you, you're not limited to saving things just as objects. I've done this before. Uh, for example, skylights. Uh, this, this is kind of a, a key use of that subtype. Um, if you want to model something as a skylight, it's not available as a skylight unless the subtype is You can model something and save it as, say, a custom window or a custom door, and then just change the subtype from a uh, wall opening to roof opening, and you have a skylight. Um, but defining specific subtypes, if it's just going to be an object, I've, I've found very little use of that. Um, I don't do a lot of macro uh, you no, know, it's it's easy enough, but it gets more complicated than I need. Uh, Mauricio said, "I usually copy the code to Word. There, I can find and replace at the same time. So it's kind of using other methodologies like Notepad and the like." Um, yeah, that might be a good workaround for that question on on highlighting uh, specific uh, text. Google Docs, would be another one, because you browser for. Uh, Bernardo says, for this example, did you recre recreate the one with the shell from scratch? Um, this then talking about the easy thing with morphs that, that objects can be exploded into more. That's, that's very true, yeah. Um, the shell has the advantage of when it's scripted, it has so few. Um, I do save morphs as objects all the time, but usually I don't combine multiples together to do that. Um, because you end up with, like we looked at uh, earlier, you just end up with thousands of lines of script, and we start combining things, tens of thousands of lines. Then your file, your embedded library, your file is is bogged down by that single. It might be really clever, really elegant, it might work really well, but uh, the file might not. Yep. Um, now Jeremiah has asked a question about Library Part Maker. It's the first time he's learned about it. Um, 
It's, a, it's actually mm -hmm. a tool that was developed by um, Graphisoft UK to try and align with the requirements of level of information, level of detail over there. Um, it's mm -hmm. now globally available, I believe. I think it's globally available for all select users, I think. I Maybe someone from Graphisoft that's watching can possibly comment in the chat about that. But um, he wants to know whether the workflow is similar. No, the workflow is completely different. The workflow, the, the only similarity is basically Library Part Maker works like its own template file. Um, so you launch Library Part Maker and it opens an ARCHICAD instance and it gives you sort of this graphic favorites layout of you know, saving a window, save it here. Or uh, you know, maybe you're trying to tie it into uh, model view options. You want to have that like sort of low, medium, high level of detail. Uh, so you can save different instances of that window and it automatically scripts that out with the levels of um, that can be useful for a lot of uh, a lot of applications, custom windows and things like that. Um, I, for the most part, haven't needed that, or if I do, I sort of. Yep. yep. And and I found it's it's quite clever in the sense that you sit down and you actually form up how you want it to graphically play and plan. So you're setting up a symbol, setting up its 3D. The only limitation I found with it is you don't you can't call upon the standard um, dictated by the building create certain pieces of the puzzle rather than uh, individual right. materials and overrides. That's the one thing that I've struggled with when I tested it. Um, Damien wants to know, have you tested the difference in performance between manually scripted parts and ARCHICAD generated parts? So what I'm assuming Damien means, in other words, um, taking the part that you've just created from the essentially converted it into, into an object versus when you're manually scripting it. Yeah, it's. I think it's, it's a lot more efficient if manually scripted in terms of just the uh, uh, density of that script. A lot of stuff that the, the saved elements will add to that script. You know, we looked at, for example, the, uh, the building materials along that profile. If I had just used a re uh, revolved shape, script that out manually, uh, I would have only had to call out that surface uh, one time. As, uh, and there I had to change it, whatever it was, six, times, seven times edge of the polygon. Um, so there's there's some efficiencies by scripting it out just in terms of how much script is needed, um, but it does require a lot more depth of knowledge, uh, and you sort of have to be able to visualize the the x y z points of everything that you're scripting. Um, you know, it's it's definitely an art form, um, and this is more of just sort of a, a bulldozer method of get that out there. Yeah, that's right. It, it it does it does manually scripting them is is a lighter solution. And, and it does less put less load on, on CAD, but when you've got this scenario where you don't have the expertise, sometimes more project to work. If you're working on major projects that are very, very large, I think that's when you probably want to get someone that can script some objects rather than allowing someone to do, manually create um, objects all over it. Is that something you think so as well? Would that be your advice as well? Oh, Pat? absolutely. Like just just consider what the object is being used for, uh, the project type, and and how many projects is for. Uh, if it's something that you need office wide and you're going to be using in every project a hundred times, it's worth putting in the effort to make it work and, and kind of give it some longevity. If it's just something you need for this project or maybe for a couple of uh, projects or development, uh, model it, save it, move on. That's right. Uh, Rob, Robert talked about there being the GDL cookbook. He, he still has a copy. It was a long, long time ago and I know that was created. David yep. Nicholson, I think, that wrote that. Um, yep. Not sure if it's still available. I think if you do Google Google searches, I think you might be able to find a. There's a actually a PDF, PDF online PDF, of it right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, there's a PDF. Uh, also, the uh, GDL help. Uh, Graphisoft has a GDL resource that's great. Um, there's a few other. There's one that's uh, um, where it's in all in German. So you actually, <laughs> I have to have a browser that translates it for me because I don't speak enough German. Um, but it's there's there's a German resource for GDL that that's really great. Uh, there's a lot of resources out there. My go-to has been uh, the Graphisoft GDL Help uh, website. It's searchable. It's got everything you can copy and paste text uh, straight. Yep. David's just making a comment in terms of adding an information in your notepad uh, instead of Word because there's no formatting in it. Which is important. Um, Bernardo's made a constant comment about putting SketchUp files, apparently, combining it with GDL and ARCHICAD. 
Um, so exporting a SketchUp, this this is actually a really useful. Uh, um, actually, I think you told me about this, Nathan. Uh, <laughs> well, this is this is this is my clever trick to to um, uh, not have to deal with um, indexes yeah. and building materials and surfaces and and fills. So. I'll let you take the glory. I won't. I'll, I'll shut up. I'll talk too much <laughs> well, today. It's your, it's your tip, but it's a great one. So if you save something in ARCHICAD as a SketchUp file and then drag and drop it back into ARCHICAD, it's awesome because you get the, uh, the SketchUp translation options for rotating automatically generated. Plus, it embeds the surfaces. So it hard codes the surface image into the object. Um, and then you don't have to worry about additional surfaces and things. And let's say I use this all the time for like artwork or area rugs and things like that, where I want to be able to stretch it and resize the image that's on there and not have to go back and micromanage all of my surface uh, tiling sizes, uh, that surface will stretch with the element, just like any object downloaded from SketchUp where it's, it's actually an awesome trick. Maybe I should actually do a presentation on that one day and, and actually share it with the world instead of uh, keeping it as a little secret that I, that I used to... Uh, <laughs> Because we wanted to bring in existing buildings, and inevitably that your templates are going to update over the years, and you're going to be accepting of that. But I wanted to bring in a 3D object of what was the adjacent buildings had the correct textures, so that when we went through in BMX, the client could see what the adjacent building looks like. Um, mm -hmm. And then we had some other crazy scripting, which where my little bit of amateur scripting came in through some experts at Fulton Trotter who guided us. But then we were able to overlay the 2D plan. As, uh, of each story, so we could see how the 2D related as well. Um, yeah, that's where... just that's just combining 2D scripts. Uh, you can write scripts that say, if it's on this story, it looks like this, and if it's on that story, it looks like that. Uh, yeah. it's... Um, there's there's lots of things going on. Uh, Christian's online. I'm see he's watching the GDL masters watching. Oh yeah, in the background. He's, but he, um, he uh, he's way way better at this than I am. <laughs> like I said, I've got the bulldozer. He's out there writing poetry with him. well i know i know that he's in the background right now creating some absolute magic and uh i had, had actually talked to him about participating in this event today and we're a little bit too early for him so i'm looking forward to um hearing from christian and Gad swift and what they're going to be coming out with in a couple of months time once it's ready public okay. release but um you know, there's a lot of more comments in there regarding the cookbook but feel free guys to uh um to keep in the comments. We're going to go over to an ad break so we can switch over to session three. Pat, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for contributing to this event and, and helping it make, make it be successful. Awesome. Uh, the comments, just really quick, the comments are going to be up while we're on the ad break, right? Because I'll yes. share a couple of them. Yes, okay. they'll, they'll still be up. All right, guys. Thanks very much, Pat. And, um, and, and let's go on to the next session. Thanks, Nathan.